Hey, Antonella, how's it going? Hey, Matt, good. How are you? Thanks for joining me. This is cool. Thank um, you, Matt. I, uh, I saw your speech at Freedom Fest about mm -hmm. Cuba, and, and I really appreciated the shout out, but I was, I think there we, we talked about getting together and talking about what's going on, mm -hmm. and specifically um, what we might learn from Latin America and the way that the socialists have, have kind of hijacked mm -hmm. the region, not everywhere, and maybe there's some bright spots we can talk about, but mm -hmm. uh, tell, um, since you're new to the show, why don't you tell people a little bit about your background, because um, um, you grew up dealing with these guys yeah absolutely in in argentina in fact uh, we have a model a, a system a populist system in argentina that is called peronism uh, you know it relates to juan domingo peron and maybe here in the u.s they know a little bit more about evita maybe you can I've remember seen the musical. yeah yes. absolutely so so they they basically they destroyed the country argentina was uh once a long time ago was one of the richest countries in the world uh it was basically compared to to the u.s and in and, and many and many countries that that were doing good because they follow good policies and they follow you know free market and private property and this all the solutions all the things that that make a a, a, a nation um good right and prosperous so these people basically destroy argentina in the 1940s and we still have that that same system that same model but juan domingo peron he was an admirer of uh, benito mussolini so he basically implemented a lot of his uh, policies in, in, in Argentina, a lot of the things from uh, the fascismo, like fascism. Uh, so, so yeah, um, and you can see that in basically the entire region. Latin America is full of these uh, models and these systems that, uh, you know, destroy innovation, they destroy incentives, they destroy everything that, that can make a, a, a region prosperous. So that's, that's how we are. So when you say populism, are you talking about uh, Peronism or Chavismo or is there, there's different brands, but what is populism to you? Well, um, I think there's many ways to, or many characteristics to, to you know, define uh, a populist in, in, in general, right? Uh, not only in Latin America, but I, I can say the, the entire world because many people follow that. Um, and you can find populists from the left and from the right. So they can appear in any side of, of the political spectrum. Um, and when, when, I, when, I, when I mention this kind of maybe, uh, you know, features or characteristics from this populist. One of them, I always say, is that they appear as uh, messiahs, as uh, the saviors uh, for, you know, they, they try to tell you that they're going to save you from imperialism, globalization, the markets, the evil that, that the market is, and, and, and all those um, enemies that they keep uh, finding all the time. Um, but they, they appear as, as the messiahs. And another thing that I see in, in basically all of them, but, but most of them in, in Latin America, and, and maybe when it comes to this you know, people like like Hugo Chavez or Fidel Castro or Juan Domingo Perón and all the populists that, that, that we have, um, the hypocrisy. They, they don't live uh, according to the way they think. Um, and in fact, they, you know, they save their money in, in dollars. They never save their money in, in Argentine pesos or Cuban pesos or bolivars in, in, in like, like the, the currency in Venezuela. Um, so hypocrisy is one of the main characteristics they, they, they have. And, and I, there's one definition that I really like when it comes to understand how they operate and how they, you know, have that structure of, you know, getting into, you know, politics. Um, and it says something like, like the populist, they cut your legs, they give you crutches, and they tell you that if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't be able to walk. And that's why they do in Latin America. And they keep, you know, destroying uh, individuals. They destroy uh, every single place they they go. And um, and the the fact with with socialism, 
I think this is this is very important because in, in Latin America, we have been facing this ideology for a long time, a long time. I mean, Cuba is, you know, they have been with this same regime for more than 62 years. That That's more than half, uh, half a century. And same in Argentina and same thing in Venezuela. In Venezuela, that's more than, than two decades and that you have the same people there. And that's a big mafia, a big mafia. And And, and they they even get money from from uh, you know all the narco trafficking that is also a consequence of the failed war on drugs that we see in, yeah I in wanted to US. talk to you about that because this is something that Martha Bueno brought up to me um, in terms of um, trying to understand how it is that Cuba is is that the communists in Cuba are clinging to power and they, they used to get money from the Soviets and then they were getting money from Venezuela And she said they're basically the, the drug mob. And, oh, yeah. And that's where they get their money. Ex explain how that works. Well, they, um, they get all that money from different mafias. And I, I always like to go to the, to the history of, of all these things that, that are happening in Latin America and that we can maybe define as the socialism of the 21st century. But it started in the, the past century. It started with, with Fidel Castro during the, the Cuban Revolution in 1959 um, when he took power and, you know, he received a lot of uh, money and subsidies from, from the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union collapsed in the 90s, um, Fidel Castro, he understood that he needed to find another place where get that money and where he could, you know, get all the, the, the resources to keep going with that, with that regime because Because, you know, in communism, you don't produce, you don't have money. And it's like uh, you can have wealth, but uh, at some point when they go with policies like distribution of wealth and they destroy the incentives and they um, hate, you know, the innovators and the producers and the people that create the, the entrepreneurs. We, we have we, we demonize the entrepreneurs in Latin America. And that's that's terrible because uh, in that way, we just believe that subsidies will solve everything. And I always say that if the subsidies were the solution, Argentina and Venezuela should be the richest countries in the world, but they are not. So there's a problem that, that we have to, to, to see. So um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Fidel Castro, he understood that that someone else should be uh, the, you know, the, the main resource for for uh, the, the island and for that communist regime. So he basically founded the Sao Paulo Forum. That's the Foro de Sao Paulo in the 90s. He did that with uh, Lula da Silva. He's a former president of Brazil and one of the most corrupt politicians in, in history, um, you know, involved in the Lava Shadow um, uh, operation and, and the money laundry and, and, and all the things that, that we know about about that system in, in Brazil. But they basically founded this Foro de Sao Paulo that was a movement of political parties in Latin America that they were getting together to fight against uh, neoliberalism. That's how they call it, of course. Um, and after that, Uh, Hugo Chavez appear in Venezuela and Fidel Castro train uh, Hugo Chavez. Fidel Castro, he, he, he was always obsessed with, with Venezuela. In fact, he tried to invade Venezuela in the 1967. Um, and of course, it was um, a failure. He, he, he wasn't able to do that. Um, but he, he always has uh, his eyes on, on, on Venezuela because of, you know, the rich, uh, the rich, of, uh, the, the wealth of, of, of that country and the oil and and all the resources they have. So Hugo Chavez, when he took power in, you know, the end of, of, of uh, the 90s, he basically, you know, he just gave Venezuela to Fidel Castro. And now Venezuela is uh, like, uh, you know, is a place that belongs to, to, to the Cubans. It belongs to, to Cuba and it belongs to uh, Iran and it belongs to China and it belongs to Russia. You see many people, you can even see uh, Russian soldiers in, in Venezuela. I mean, I, I, I went to Venezuela many times. I went to Cuba one time uh, like six years ago. And um, and you see all these all this, uh, things and how the you know they get these connections with 
the narco trafficking with the Marxist guerrillas from Colombia, like the FARC and ELN, and then, you know, the operations of uh, the Islamic terrorism inside Venezuela. That's another big thing. You know, Hezbollah and Hamas, they operate inside inside the country. And that's a big mafia. That's a huge mafia. And they did all this. And since, you know, the, this, the start of this new century, they created what is called the socialism of the 21st century. That is a wave of populists that you can see in many countries and basically the entire region in Latin America that it's a network of, of uh, corrupt politicians. So with the, the collapse of uh, oil production in mm -hmm. Venezuela because of these socialist policies, they shifted to um, the drug trade. Mm -hmm. And and this this is one of one of the libertarian proposals. If you want to do something about yeah. instability in Latin America, if you're worried about mm -hmm. um, these massive caravans fleeing all of the the violence um, and the war on drugs, yeah, yeah, that's what we need to to to, to stop. Uh, the war on drugs had a, a terrible impact in Latin America, and we don't see that. Um, I mean, from here, we don't see that impact the, when it comes to insecurity, when it comes to violence, when it comes to poverty, when it comes to um, giving basically that money to, you know, finance many campaigns uh, and many, you know, populist politicians that go towards socialism or communism and uh, and, and all this collectivism that, that that we see in, in the region so so yeah we, we really need to 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 stop that model of um you know deciding for 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 the others um because i see that in, in many countries you see many governments trying to impose a morality they try to impose a, a way uh for you to live your life according to what they think is a perfect model for you know the the the, the society or or how you have to live your life um so so yeah i think that's a huge problem that that we still have and we see that both from the left and both from the right because we see populisms uh in in both and collectivisms in both uh, sides of the political talk, talk about um uh is there what is the flavor of right wing populism in Latin America? Who who represents that? Well, we see that that right wing populism in in countries like Brazil right now with people like Jair Bolsonaro. He is one of the people that he represents that that right wing movement in 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 Latin America. Uh, we see that in countries like Chile. We see that in countries it starts rising in in countries like Argentina with different movements, of, you know, related to nationalism. And and I always say. That that you know nationalism is a is a religion of the state is a religion of the state and they they just want to destroy the individual and get you know the idea of this collectivist uh, and nationalist idea um, to impose and 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 they you know it, it, it also tends to relate this to to you know xenophobia and and racism and and all these these things that that are you know terrible when it comes to 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 liberties to civil liberties and um and many people and i think this is important because many people they they don't understand in latin america what liberalism or libertarianism really is and then when this kind of you know characters appears they just relate us to to them and i mean they don't even talk about economic liberties because they just you know they go for um you know tariff wars and you know substitution of of, of imports and all these protectionist policies and mercantilism um so they relate us to to the right that's that's that keeps happening in latin america all the time and they don't know that liberalism or libertarianism is not only about economic liberties it's also about political liberties but also about civil liberties like all the individual liberties you cannot divide liberty um and i and i like this um uh, you know how how deidre mccloskey says that liberty is liberty is liberty and that's basically it and we want just uh, a society you know with with uh, adults um because I, I i also agree with Deidre mccloskey on that because i think liberalism is adultism is yeah. how, waiting for for everybody and and even the government um to treat you like like an adult and that's that's what we need we need to stop with that mentality that uh some sometime you know that that always some someone's gonna be working for us or paying for everything that that we that we need um so that mentality 
of distribution of wealth is something that that we really have in in Latin America and we keep punishing success we demonize the entrepreneur we demonize the creators the innovators and we we don't understand uh, about liberalism or libertarianism or capitalism and and when you see these these movements these right-wing movements um, they basically you know they like they even like to use the word liberalism or liberal or classical liberal or, li or libertarian um, um, so so yeah and I think And I think that's another thing because uh, many, many of the biggest enemies of liberty nowadays appear as liberty lovers. So we have to understand how to identify this, this character. So, um, what what is the what is the alternative? Because this we're seeing this play out in the United States as well. That the reaction to radical leftist policies, socialist policies is a form of sort of conservative mm -hmm. nationalism. Mm -hmm. And I've always struggled with this left-right thing anyway because, you know, when I was a kid I was taught that that Mao and Stalin were on the far left and their intentions were good but they went too far and that Hitler was on the far right, but when you when you study these movements in practice Um, there's a lot of nationalism mm -hmm. in socialism mm -hmm. and there's a lot of socialism in nationalism and the and it's it's all they all started as populist movements that that demonized something mm -hmm. you know as lenin would but it seems like um, the pendulum swings from the right to the left for different flavors of the same thing and liberalism classical liberalism that you're describing um, I've always wondered if we could sort of mash up populism and libertarianism. I actually call myself a libertarian populist in the sense that there are things that we can be pissed off about too, right? Uh, big government abuse of power, um, the stripping of our civil liberties mm -hmm. and all these things. So I just, I just don't, I, I wonder why we keep losing the marketing battle mm -hmm. every time there's an opportunity to point out that socialism is failing, people are starving. Okay, so um, when it comes to the to the marketing uh, level of, of, of ideas and, and how we you know it at some point we are not able to to you know send the message and tell people this is liberalism or this is libertarianism and and this is you know the the, the, the good idea because it gives you you know good results progress it just lets you live you know and let you live in peace and being a adult a responsible adult and just go ahead with your life and don't hurt people and don't take your stuff just like you say um but the thing is that i think that for a long time we just talk about Uh, the free markets or capitalism or economic liberties and we completely forgot about individual liberties so in the meantime the left took all those flags away from us um, and then you see the left talking about feminism um, and then you see them talking about LGBT rights and you see them talking about the legalization of drugs maybe sometimes in, in Latin America it happens um, but Of course, they also want they, they always want to use the state for that. So that's not the real solution. Uh, and we just want all that. I mean, and when you go to the, the origins of liberalism and libertarianism, it's all about individual liberties. It's all about civil liberties. Of course, I think that the private property is, is important. The, the, the free market is super important too. Um, you know, the rule of law, that's, that's, it's all a, like, a, like a, you know, uh, all the entire idea of, of, of liberty, but that's, that's not it. We also have to talk about this, this civil liberty. So I always talk about how, um, you know, feminism I mean, its origins, it was a, a libertarian movement with people like Mary Wollstonecraft talking about the importance of, of women and the rights of women uh, to vote, to get education, to divorce, to have and to own property. Um, and same thing with LGBT rights. I think that uh, that's also super and very important. I mean, when it comes to, to, to the ideas of, of liberty, it's just you doing what you want as an adult with your body and with your sexual life and no one else has to to you know decide for you not the state or your family or no one it's just you and it's a voluntary contract just like everything else in when it comes to uh to to liberty um but yeah i see that 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 many people 
in even in in Europe, I see a, a rise of nationalism and right wing movements in, in 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 even in Europe and, and here in the U.S. of course and Latin America, but we think that um, you defeat um, left wing populism with right wing populism, and that's where when you see the pendulum, mm-hmm. right? And we go from extreme to extreme, and then it's just uh, the one that you know gets get out of of, of all that is just the individual who is. The one who is who is hurt. So so yeah. So I want to talk about this book because there's something in here that um, you're reminding me of, and and, and early on you talk about uh, democracy. Um, a lot of libertarians get anxious when you utter the word democracy, and and I would rather define it the way that you do in the book, which is mm-hmm. democracy, and and the market is the same thing because everybody's choosing. Everybody's has autonomy over their choices, and everybody gets what they want. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's the good version of democracy. Mm-hmm. And you know, the, the the scary version is when fifty one percent of the people get to tell the other forty nine percent what they get. Mm-hmm. Um, but but part of it is is maybe a language thing where you know instead of uh, worrying about democracy, we should embrace it and define it. And that's what I'm doing with populism. I understand the history of populism, but if we could make liberty popular mm-hmm. and it could be some combination of um, all of the horrible things that, that governments have done to oppress people and that's 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 a key part of populism is being angry at something right mm-hmm. um, well we have some righteous anger mm-hmm. but the other half is this beautiful cooperation that happens when people are free and they they're creative and and they find ways to work together and do beautiful things. We have a hard time explaining that to people. Mm-hmm. And and by the way, one of the beautiful things I'm going to plug your book here, Capitalism: The Antidote to Poverty. Um, one of the beautiful things that freedom does is it saves lives and lifts people out of poverty and gives them things that they could not have imagined were possible. But nobody knows it. Mm-hmm. Nobody, nobody realizes where this stuff came from. Mm-hmm. And you talk about this in the book. Yeah, and we take for granted all the things that we have, all the uh, solutions, the, the, the technology that we have, all the um, medical solutions that we have, uh, you know, the internet, uh, this microphone, uh, everything, everything that we have, we just basically take it for granted. And we think that it just, I don't know, it falls from uh, trees, just like money. Many people think in Latin America that, that money falls from, uh, the money that, that the populace, you know, they distribute, they think that it just uh, falls from, from the trees. And that's... that's it, it may actually in Venezuela. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, basically. Um, yeah, and the thing for, I mean, in Venezuela, that's, that's, you know, I, and I think it's, it's important because I connected with the institutional uh, thing to see and to understand this and, and how we need uh, better institutions and how we need, you know, um, uh, legal security. We need uh, rule of law. And we don't, we don't, we don't talk about that. We don't understand that. For example, Venezuela, they already had 27 constitutions. Can you imagine the U.S. having 27 constitutions? Like uh, you have, um, you know, every single president, basically they write a new constitution and that's changing the rules of the game every single time for in every single administration. And when you do that, I mean, no one no one is going to invest in your country because no one knows, uh, you know, what's going to be the, the, the mood of, of the populace that, that is that is ruling in, in, in that time. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how how, how it, it works in, in, in Venezuela and same thing in, in, in Cuba. Um, and we are poor and we are poor because we we just cling to, you know, bad ideas. Venezuela, you know, there the the average salary of a Venezuelan is one dollar a month. In Cuba is ten dollars a month. In Cuba, for example, if you want to buy a kilo of meat, you gotta um, you know work for basically three months and a half to to get uh, a kilo of meat. In, in 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 if you found it, because if you find it, because that's uh, a shortage of, of food and everything, just like it happens in you know in, under communism. Um, but yeah, we really need to to understand and and to you know maybe create uh, or, or think another way to deliver this message. And I like people like Johan Norberg, for example. He, with, with his books, he is basically 
talking with a with a positive message. He's telling us, hey, this is what we achieve. And we achieve all this when we follow good ideas, when we, um, you know, when we decided that we needed to um, divide power, when we needed to, um, you know, stop all these politicians to, you know, do whatever they, they, they just basically want to do. Uh, when we went to, you know, for free markets, for capitalism, for globalization. And if you see the history of Homo sapiens, and if you see the history of our humanity, I mean, we basically live 99% of our entire history uh, in extreme poverty. And everything changed, what, like 200 years ago, 250 years ago, when we understood the importance of commerce, when we understood the importance of rule of law, the importance of um, globalization, when we understood the importance even of individual liberties. Um, and, you know, 200 years ago, basically the 95% of, of the world's population was, they lived under, you know, extreme poverty. And now that number is 9%. So we achieved a lot of things. And I mean, the world is better now than, you know, any other time in history. So when I see that and when I see all the progress that we achieve as a humanity and then you go to Latin America and you see countries like Venezuela or countries like Cuba where people are suffering. And, you know, when you see in Cuba, basically 90 percent of the population, they are poor. And it's just why? Right. Why we keep uh, following uh, bad ideas if we have the solutions to, um, you know, to end poverty. And yeah, and I think that's we, we, we think that you end poverty by redistributing wealth or uh, with subsidies. But the best way to end poverty is creating wealth. Uh, so when were you in Venezuela? I went to Venezuela many times, but last time was uh, three years ago. Uh, in Cuba was six years ago. I cannot go back to 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 Cuba. I think I cannot go back to to Venezuela. But 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 in Cuba, it was it was very complicated. In fact, when I left the country, the regime released uh, a letter, a public letter, saying that I violated the travel visa, um, and that I was a CIA agent, and you know all the things that they say. Um, but 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 that was a very hard uh, experience for me. That was uh, one of the most complicated things that I that I've done in, in, in my entire life. When you see communism yeah. firsthand, when you feel that, when you, um, I went to, for example, I went visiting uh, the Ladies in White. That's a group of women that you know they protest and peacefully dressed in white uh, for the freedom of, of Cuba and their families that that are political prisoners. Um, and I went to visit the ladies in white. And when I was inside the house, uh, when I was about to leave, they were like, okay, Antonella, you know that uh, the regime knows everything. They are listening to us because the house is full of microphones. We don't even know where they are. Uh, and when you go out, when you leave the house, just, you know, down your head and just walk as fast as possible because they know you're here. And when you feel that, when you... Um, experience communism that's one of the hardest things that you can experience in your life and that was for me that's that was just a week I cannot imagine how, how it is to live under that system under that model in Venezuela it happened something very similar for example um, I went to the last radio station that they had um, it, it doesn't exist anymore but in that time it, it existed um, and and I went to this radio station and before going live uh, they were Antonella please don't mention this don't mention this don't say that name um, and and that's that's also hard when you have to you know uh, self-censor yeah. yourself that's so you're um, you're kind of a celebritarian in Latin America, <laughs> right? So it's for you to go is different than just anybody to go because at some point they know who you are. Yeah, they know. They know. Yeah. They know everything. And they don't like you. They don't like me. <laughs> and you should be proud of this. Yeah, yeah, I'm proud. I'm proud. They don't like me. Um, the left, they, you know, they don't like me. Uh, politicians from the right, they don't like me. And I'm very proud because it means that we are um, doing, you know, what we what we need to do. Yeah. That is promote uh, the entire 
message of liberty not being like you know cherry picking and be like oh i like this liberty but i don't like that liberty so i'm not gonna follow that and i want to impose a certain model of life to people uh and that's not the way that's not the way liberty works uh it's the complete liberty it's not uh that you can divide liberty it's a it's liberty and is that is that i'm, I'm promoting all your books here but this one mm-hmm El Manual Liberal. Oh yeah, that's the the, the, this, the classical liberal handbook or okay. the libertarian handbook. And I know all of the contributors here. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a compilation of, of uh, essays from mm, all the classical liberal and libertarians uh, friends uh, from from the basically the entire world. I have people from Europe. Um, I have people from Latin America, the United States. I have Tom Palmer, David Bose, Deidre McCloskey. She wrote the, the epilogue of, of the book. Um, and there she mentions all this idea of, of how, uh, well, she, she talks a lot about that in, in his lectures, but, but how uh, liberalism is adultism. And I love that concept because I think that's, that's how it works and that's how it is. Um, we just, we don't want a nanny state. We don't want people treating us like they can decide for ourselves and telling us how to live our lives or what we can do with our bodies or what we can, you know, consume or what we can drink or what we, uh, what drugs we can use or who we can go to bed with. It's just, it's just not something that the state has to do. Um, so, so this one's in Spanish and most of your work is, yeah. is in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, we've, talk this entire time about how Latin America is is a cesspool of socialists and nationalists mm -hmm. but there is a liberty movement and the Atlas network is is part of that nexus talk about talk about the work you do to actually turn young people onto liberty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at Atlas Network, we uh, we have the Center for Latin America, where we promote the ideas of liberty in, in Latin America and the entire region. We also work with, with our friends from, from Spain, because I think we also, we, well, we share a huge heritage. Um, and we keep promoting the, the, the ideas, you know, with um, creating content, um, you know, organizing uh, events all, all over the region, helping our partners to uh, keep uh, doing the, the great the great job they, they, they do in, in, in Latin America so so yeah is um, I mean censorship is a real problem but does social media mostly cut through that in like can you still talk to people in Venezuela without the radio station you can do that but they know I mean the regime knows they know that you're you know talking about certain things that you shouldn't be talking about or talking to certain people that you shouldn't be talking with um but this happens in country i mean it's even more complicated in countries like venezuela cuba nicaragua in argentina it's not that way it's not that hard um but but we are i mean we are on our way to 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 that we are following that path um so I'll give you an example related to, to what we were talking about the, the, when it comes to subsidies and the, that, that we don't understand how you end poverty uh, by creating wealth. Um, in Argentina, we have a population of 45 million people. And basically, 21 million people, they live from the state. They receive money from the state. That's almost the half of the country receiving money from, from the government. And you only have 7 million people working in the private sector. So it's just, it makes no sense. You have 7 million people working for 20 one million people um, and it happens in every single country in Latin America it happens in every single country now Peru they fell into communism again uh, Colombia is m moving towards that path um, so it never it never ends and then you see that it's, it's the pendulum that you were talking about is that uh, and we think that yeah we can um, you know defeat the, the, the left-wing populism with right-wing populism and you just it, it, it things get worse when you when you do that um but yeah do you, so you were um guardedly optimistic in july when you spoke at freedom fest about cuba mm -hmm. because we were seeing this massive uprising and the, the cuban people are sort of at a point where they have nothing to lose mm -hmm. i mean it's very dangerous to go into the streets um 
but we don't hear about Cuba anymore. Mm -hmm. And part of that may be the, the media not wanting to tell that story. Are you still optimistic that the good guys can <laughs> survive and win in Cuba? Well, I try to be optimistic <laughs> because in Latin America, if you're not optimistic, you just, uh, it's so complicated. But um, for Cuba, I think, I think this is the very start of 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 the, of the end. Maybe we can call it like like that. We can define what's happening just like that. Like the the, the start of, of of the end of of this uh, regime. But remember that is a, a regime that has been there for sixty two years, and that's basically you know more than six decades. The same people taking over a, a, an entire island uh, and they had the they have the, the modus operandi from the Soviet Union because they learn everything from the Soviet Union they know how to control your mind they know how to control every single aspect of, of your life um, in Cuba you even have this is uh, the CDR is this a CDR the, the committee of uh, uh, defense of, of the revolution something like that um, and you have that in every single um, in every single block uh, because that's basically people like normal people they don't you know they are not like you know people that work for for for, for the state or they're just a regular people like a regular neighbor um and they basically report everything that is happening in that block to the next level you know to to and it's just a a, um, a methodology where you don't even trust the people you have in front of you is very, very complicated. In in communism, you know that's that's a the, the, one of the biggest expressions of, of communism. That's a very example of, of communism. I mean, whenever I go to, for example, Argentina and I go to a TV debate or, or something, they're like, "Oh, but that's not real communism." I mean, that's communism. That's that's what they, they do. That's what they have. They don't have private property. Maybe you remember Hugo Chavez a long time ago in Venezuela doing a saying that's expropria, say expropria, like expropriate or nationalize this or that or whatever he wanted. Um, because we don't have institutions. We don't have rule of law. We don't have free markets. We don't we we have um, nothing nothing related to to you know good ideas when it comes to to institutions so so yeah in cuba well they had this guy che guevara maybe i'm, I'm sure you know about che guevara he was a he was basically a murder how, how could i not right yeah so the propaganda campaign yeah was and ubiquitous. you see many people here even in the u.s wearing the shirts with with his face and and i'm from rosario and from argentina and he he was born in, in the same city in rosario uh so the city is full of uh, you know the, the you see his face everywhere the che guevara street the the che guevara corner everything is about Che Guevara and I don't understand how we don't see who that person was I mean he even said that he wrote a letter to his father um, where he was saying something like that today I understood that I like killing people he wrote that he literally wrote that. Um, and then there's a, a, a very famous uh, video where he's speaking at the General Assembly of the United Nations, where he says, um, we kill, we are killing people, and we're going to keep killing people until it's necessary. I mean, and, and he even ran La Cabaña. It was a, a, de a detention camp that, that they have in, in, in Cuba because Cuba used to have also concentration camps. And they, they were called UMAP, uh, like military unities of, of um, control of production or something like that. It was basically uh, a place where Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, they sent anyone who wasn't, um, who, who didn't fit the idea of the, the, the new man, the new Marxist man, the perfect revolution man um, so that's I mean when you have that idea for 60 years and when you control the education when you control the media when you control everything that's it's not easy to get rid of of, of that yeah. Um, but yeah yeah we had uh, Maria Warlau on mm -hmm. and she talked about the Soviet-based Che marketing campaign mm -hmm. 
So they, they erased the actual history and turned him into this sex symbol. And, and there's a complete disconnect between mm-hmm. the monster that he was mm-hmm. and the cool T-shirt. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's, that's, that's the frustrating part of what we deal with because a lot of times these debates feel like they're fact-free. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that wasn't real socialism. And um, it's the market's fault that Venezuelans are poor. And and naturally, that makes me think of um, everybody's favorite congresswoman, uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, mm. and and we on the show we've tried to understand um, her appeal to a lot of young people. But she said um, so famously or infamously that that she never knew prosperity, that her generation, growing up in New York, mm-hmm. never never knew prosperity. Mm-hmm which is factually absurd Mm -hmm. because she grew up in the most prosperous Mm -hmm. nation at the most prosperous time in history. But the context for her is probably important. And for young people that feel anxiety about about their economic situation, we have to deal with that as it is Mm -hmm. and not just like make fun of it as oh that's silly because mm-hmm. people feel that way yeah and and, and i openly invite uh, alexandria ocasio cortez to uh, go to venezuela and go to cuba and live there for a few months for a year maybe but live not like uh the the people that works for for the regime live just like every single cuban live just like more than 90 percent of the population lives like like in extreme poverty without uh without food you know they they have in cuba uh the castros they implemented what is called the 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 ration book that they the booklet it's basically a a little booklet that tells you how how many things you can buy um a month when it comes to food and I mean, when you when you hear this kind of, um, you know, politicians uh, saying things and taking things for granted and taking innovation for granted and taking progress for granted and done understanding about even social mobility, because they talk about, well, in, 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 in inequality or all these things that uh, or we have to distribute wealth or tax the rich. Right. So. It's all about that. You keep punishing success. You punish the success. Uh, so anyone who is successful, it's just like, no, that's bad. He, he, he cannot do that. We have to take basically a 50% of what that people owns and just give it to anyone who needs it. And that's not the way you create wealth. And we don't understand wealth, not only in Latin America, but also here in the US. We don't understand wealth. We don't understand the creation of wealth. We don't understand that it's not a zero-sum game, right? What, what Ludwig von Mises used to call the dogma de Montaigne, the Montaigne's dogma. Um, that it basically says that the poor is poor because the rich is rich. And I say that is that's something like, like saying that um, the healthy is healthy because the sick is sick. Or that the Formula One is fast because the uh, regular cars you see on the street, they go slow. And it's, it has nothing to do with, with, with it. It's just two things that are not related. You create wealth. You don't distribute wealth. You create wealth. In fact, basically the 50% of uh, all the wealth that exists in the world was created in the last 30 years. Um, and it's all about that. You create wealth where, w- or where you have uh, the incentives, where you, as an innovator or as an entrepreneur, you have your property, you know, property rights or the government respect your time or whenever you, you know, you have all these uh, elements that are vital when it comes to, to, to innovation and to, to create progress. And, and, and I'm always like, m- many people ask me we, why we don't have those talents and those innovators and those entrepreneurs that you see in countries like the United States, why we don't have that in Latin America. It's not that we don't have that. We are full of talented people. But those, those guys, they are maybe in countries like Venezuela, you know, dying of, you know, starvation because they, they don't have food or dying in countries like Cuba where you don't have access to medicines. Um, and it's all about the institutions uh, in, in, in the country that, that you are at. Okay, let's, let's leave it there. How do we find you and Atlas so that people can check out your stuff? 
Uh, well, I have a, my own website. It's uh, www.antonella Marti, Antonella with double L and Marty with uh, Y uh, dot com. And on social media, I'm just in all my social media is, is Antonella Marti. So you can find me uh, there. And yeah, you can follow Atlas Network, follow the, the, the things that we do at the Center for Latin America, promoting the ideas of liberty. I'm also part of the Atlas Society. I'm a fellow uh, at the Atlas Society and I, I'm the CEO of Sociedad Atlas. It's a, uh, like the Spanish the Spanish branch of, of the Atlas Society where we promote the ideas of Ayn Rand. So I also uh, invite people to, to follow us uh, and, and yeah, uh, let, let them know what, what, what we do to promote uh, the good ideas that, that are going to change Latin America if, if we stop, you know, clinging to bad ideas and communists and collectivists and, and all these altruists that we see in the entire region. Let's do this again sometime. We'll talk about Ayn Rand and geek out. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people. Mm-hmm.